blessing to be in the house of God. This morning I was very blessed by the devotional thoughts that were shared. I could make a few comments as I go over my notes, make a few comments on the, on the meditation and the message would be covered. I thought about turning around and making some lines on the board, numbering and saying, well, this is, we're right down to things that that I have that contradict what was said earlier and then write nothing down. It's the way the word of God works. I, I marvel again at the work of God. I, uh, had a thought as we were sitting here before we get into the message. <clears throat> Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. And as I thought about if Jesus' kingdom, that we are warned over and over in the Bible not to fight among people. It's not God's way. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if we were, if, when we fight, there will be casualties. If there's war, there's casualties. There's people, there's men that are killed. That's casualties. And it, when, when there's fighting among God's people, if we are an army and we're fighting among ourselves, then there will be casualties. And that's not God's way. God's way is for all to come to repentance. For a message this morning, the title that, I, that came to me is What Makes You Godly? And it would be interesting to just open it up for each person. The first obvious question is, would be that, are you godly? And I trust we would all say yes, that is at least our goal, that's our desire. That's what we want. Or we can affirm that yes, we are godly. We are godly people. But what makes you godly? Is it being born again and that we're put into a little capsule that nothing can get to us and we're just protected all around? That's not the way I find it as such, but as we face the obstacles of life, the um, temptations, the the fightings that we face at times, they all tend to wear down what we endeavor to be by the grace of God. So we think of the word godly. Webster says it is pious, devout. Strong's gives it as kind. Re religious, religiously, it means pious or a saint. And then looking up the word pious in Webster, it says marked by or showing reverence for deity and devotion to divine worship. You know, interestingly, the same word is used for exposing a hypocrite as pious words and uncharitable deeds. And that's kind of the, the essence this morning. As I was looking at some scriptures my, my focus went to Psalm 12, and that will be our text this morning. You can turn to that. But as I, was, as I was looking, I was surprised, as I looked up the word godly in the Bible, we are almost halfway through the Bible before the word appears. The word godly first appears in Psalm 4, verse 3. <clears throat> says, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. <clears throat> so that's, that's a promise that we want to claim as God's people. The Lord has set apart or he has distinguished or put a difference in him that is godly, him or her. That's the first time that it appears in the Bible. But we know that Prior to this, there were many godly people in the Bible. 
There was Noah and Job and Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, and, and just on and on. And how do we know that they were godly if the Bible doesn't call them godly? We, we can tell by the, the walk of, their walk of life. The life that they lived spoke of their faith in God. And that's really what makes us godly is when we have our faith and our hope set on, in God and we come to God through Jesus Christ. Psalm 32 verse 6 says, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. And that is also part of our being godly is that we pray to God. We recognize that that's our source of strength, that's our help, that's everything that we need. Everyone that is godly will pray in a time that thou mayest be found. We don't wait until he can't be found anymore, until we've drifted away far enough that he, God cannot be found. God is there. God gave us that promise. He that, uh, if, if you seek me, you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's the way God is found. Another verse with godly in it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But then I, as I was looking at Psalm 12, let's read. Verse 1, it says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all the... All flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, With our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. As I came across this verse, these verses here, I guess I just kind of stalled on it and, and uh, thinking about what makes us godly. And I guess the, the point for me is, was simply to find myself and see how, uh, of my own, how, how I fit right in this, this song. It says, the godly man ceaseth. Sees it, it runs out. It comes to an end. One way or another. Godly men come to an end. Whether it's through death, you know, as we look at various people, the people that we know in life, there's many godly people that have died. They are here no more. There are many people that they are they're not um, in a true sense godly anymore. They, but that, that's our tendency is to drift away. It takes urgency, it takes uh, effort on our part to stay close to God, to be godly. Now it's not like we're, uh, we hitch up our britches and we're, we're going to do this. That's not what it's all about. It's our dependence on God, praying to God in the time when, when, we, when He hears us and the time that we need Him, which is all the time, but sometimes we don't recognize it that way. For the, for the faithful men fail from among the children of men. It's, it's our tendency. And what do they do? And it's so subtle. So subtle. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. I find that, that I get caught up in that. I don't know how you find it. I don't know if you, I trust you, in the, in the still of the night, you wake up, maybe, in, and maybe it's uh, your quiet time and devotions, and you re realize that and it, it hit me this morning that I was again was too quick to say something too too quick to cut it off rather than Lord what do you want me to say what do you want me to do
because we're godly today doesn't guarantee that we will be godly next year. The thrust here isn't so much in dying and being removed from the scene, but the, our tendency to failure. We don't have to fail, and we don't want to, to uh, give a dismal picture here because we don't have to fail. God works in our hearts day by day as we allow him to, and we can overcome even our, what we would call our shortcomings. God is able to restore the, the years the locusts have eaten. He, God can do anything if we allow him to. And not only in our own hearts and lives, you know, even as we think of um, older faithful people passing on, there's, there's a new generation coming on as well that want to serve God. And that's encouraging to me. There's, there's new converts and, new, and young people that rise up and they fulfill God's purpose. God's work, God's kingdom will continue. It doesn't take me to keep it going. I'm probably more of a hindrance than I am a help. But God, God will continue to work and supply for the, the needs that, that he has here in the kingdom that he's building. First, we want, to, we want to look at some of the subtle traits of being ungodly, even while portraying the, the essence of godliness, because we can easily get, up, get caught up in hypocrisy. That's what, this is what David was observing. It's not necessarily that he was looking at other people. I think he was looking in the mirror, looking at himself, for the godly man sees us, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. The man of God that he was, when he got a glimpse of how God sees it, this is what he, then he penned these words. And if we would, are paraphrasing some of the uh, writings in uh, verse two, it says they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. Here's some, uh, some words that I borrowed from uh, either commentaries or other writers, that they speak things to their associates that are destructive, bring to ruin, are deceptive, false, and useless, which correlates to idolatry. They use flattering lips. Romans says it this way, with good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. You know, if, you, if you're going to believe anything that you hear, then uh, it's not hard to, to tell you something that, that's not true. But if, you, if I would, if I would uh, discern the word of God this morning and you just take it for what it says, I could leave some words out and change the meaning. Same way with a, a story about someone that we heard about this past week or where, whatever. If we can say it in a way that will, that I can make you think, if you're not gonna check into the story, I can make you think whatever I want you to think about that person. Flattering lips, good words and fair speeches. It goes on to, this is Adam Clark's comment on it. It says they are false and hollow. They say one thing while they mean another. There is no trusting in what they say. And then he goes on to say, with, and with a double heart, you know, uh, think of a, a double heart pumping blood within. You, it, the way the body functions, it, it works against each other. I don't know how that would probably wouldn't even wouldn't even work unless the body would be divided in the middle and one pump for one side and the other for the other. But here it says with uh, with a double heart, with a heart and a heart is actually the way it comes up in the Strong's. But it's, it seems like they have two hearts, one to speak fair words and the other one to invent mischief. Again, that's words from someone else. But that's, that's the picture that it, that it gives here. We want to, at least I find, I want to say something bad in a nice way. You know, I don't, 
I don't want to say something good about someone that I, that I don't really, uh, the, that's where the problem comes in, the person I don't really like. I want to say something good about it, but yet it wouldn't look good for me if I would say something really bad about him. So I say it in a good way and give the, the idea of, <clears throat> you know, he's not really what he ought to be. The tendency of man is to follow nature coming, rising again with two hearts. It took me a while to work through this one, but it's the heart is being is being the innermost being, the feelings, the will, the intellect, the center of all that matters. That's what the heart is. And we have when we when there's a double heart, there's two hearts that are vying for the action, and the stronger one is winning. Which one is it going to be? It's like uh, like one man he gave the illustration of his like two dogs that are fighting and said well what which which one's going to win and he said well, the one you say sick them to it, it's the one that gets the the help the encouragement and that's where we we look to God we need all the help we can get The stronger one is winning. I, I'm sure that the, the modern society would have a name for it, you know, if they would even recognize that there's a double heart. But two hearts, one, one wanting to look good in what is done, and the other is desperate to get an undercut in. Again, some uh, translations from uh, other people. It's a, well, they call it a kind of a curious translation and a paraphrase speaking ill of his neighbor with smooth words speaking ill to beguile his neighbor and spend their time in vain speech without profit and no good fruit you know, they, they speak vanity vanity is something that is desolate is evil destructive guile ruin useless just words that are used to describe what it's meaning here you know, it doesn't paint a very nice picture, but ungodliness isn't supposed to be nice. I don't know why it why it's so appealing so many times, because I guess it because it it entertains the flesh, but in God's eyes, it it's um, it's not very pretty at all. And again, this this description isn't supposed to make us think of other people or that it might fit or. Or rather, you know, it's how do, how do I fail in this and how can I overcome? How can I improve in my, in my, you know, how can people tell that I'm godly? It's because of the way we talk, the way we act, what we do. And we can say all the right words. And we've, we've heard this many, many times that Someone gives a, a glowing testimony, but then goes home and maybe fights with his wife, or maybe he goes out and gets drunk. You know, it, it doesn't fit together. And we say, well, that's out there. Well, how close does it come into my own heart? How much of a double heart do I have? Flattering words while bringing an accusation does not constitute godliness. And it says, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. The Lord in his own way will cut off. He will sever. And I, I'm again reminded that if we allow the Lord to do the cutting, to do the sever, severing, before those words come out, well, there's obviously less reaping, but it, as we allow the Lord to work in our hearts, then those words may never come out. That double heart will never, well, the, the other heart will not show. The heart, of, the heart that we have after God is the one that will thrive. But it takes, again, a constant effort on our part to to um, have it turned the right way. 
It says, with our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? That's part of that psalm. Verse 4. With our tongue will we prevail. And there's many that can, they, have, they can have a, some flowing words that, that are smooth, that you just, your mind just, just gets wrapped around what, they, what they've said, and you don't think for yourself. Our lips are our own. Our tongue will prevail. And it gives a question. Who, it's like they're asking, who is Lord over us? But you know, this, the, this Lord that it's, is here is not a capital L. Who is Lord? Who is ruling over us? It's not the Lord Jesus. It's not with a capital L. You know, we can say what we want pretty well. Free speech is a so-called right in America. But a child of God will only speak as it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. I trust that's each one of our desire. We may not attain it every time, but I trust it's our desire, and if we have that desire, God will continue to work. Our lips must be sanctified through the blood of Jesus. Actually, it goes deeper than that. We're sanctified in heart, and what comes out of our heart will, will have a changed tone. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And that price is the precious blood of Jesus. Paul, when he was giving direction to the, the church on how to uh, prophesy and how to speak and preach, he said, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What we, what we say, what we do, everything that comes out our godliness is subject to what we allow. We make choices. God gives us that um, privilege. So this, our spirit, what comes out, it it's, uh, says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So we can rule our own spirit in the sense that as we have God, first of all, in our lives, For the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needy, we have, we all have the tendency to treat people like we have been treated. <coughs> because I don't treat, because I don't get treated right by someone, doesn't mean that I will treat everyone right. You know, often we have this this idea that, you know, we we hear of someone that's that has a hardship, and not, you know, maybe people are giving them a hard time for something. We say, well, the poor fellow. But you know, many times, that person will go home and he will treat the same way that he has been treated. And we could use the, the, um, the example of a, a boss that is a, kind of a slave driver and he, he treats his help in a despicable way. Well, that help at the end of the day, may go home and take it out on his wife or his children. And oftentimes, if that happens, then the, the elder siblings will do that same thing to the younger ones because, because of, uh, that's what they see. And the oppressor is not necessarily one that has power over another. You know, sometimes we think, well, he has, he's under the power of the other person. But generally, it is one that assumes power. You know, we really don't have power over other people. He does and says things that suppress the privileges of another. But you know, God takes notice. God takes notice when the underdog gets abused. I'll give you one example. 
in Exodus 3, 7, it says, The Lord said, this is the talking about the children of Israel. God came to Moses and said he's going to bring the children of Israel out. He said, The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God sees. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, just before he was stoned, he gave a sermon. And this is a verse that, that he referred to, and he said, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. That's God speaking again. And he's, he is uh, pulling out of the Old Testament the other verse that I just read. He said, I have seen, I have seen the affliction. It's repeated. And I don't know, I don't understand Greek. I'm not a Greek scholar. But I heard someone say that there's uh, no punctuation in Greek. So for extra emphasis, it's repeated. I have seen, I have seen. It gives me the picture that the heart of God is, is tender toward those that are being afflicted. Extra emphasis on the points that are repeated. Verily, verily. Holy, holy, holy. My God, my God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Behold, behold. Oh, those are just a few that I thought about. I don't know how many more there are. Extra emphasis. God is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. God takes notice. He said uh, in said I will arise, verse five. God takes notice and he said, Now will I arise. It is much better to be oppressed than to be the oppressor, but we can be both. One proof of our godliness is how we respond. Even if we don't respond right initially, the, if we respond, it's harder, takes more humility, go back and respond rightly and, and correct our wrong response. But it's proof of our godliness when we if God can touch our hearts and, and show us this is an error. Our response should always be such that it honors Jesus and his work in our heart, a single heart. Jesus' teaching was, bless them to curse you, do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you. What is my response when people despitefully use me? I just don't want anything to do with them. That's not right. That's not the way Jesus responded. But it's not saying that we have to continue in it. We can remove ourselves from a situation. The children of Israel gave themselves under the hardships of Pharaoh. They groaned under the hardships. Being people, they probably murmured, but they didn't try to do anything of their, of their own. And even as Pharaoh made these, these steps harder for them, you know, they had to, to go get their own material to make these bricks and, and so forth. When the children of Israel had opportunity to leave, they did. And likewise, God opens doors for us as well. There's many times that, that we have opportunity to move, move on and walk with God away from our oppressor. But going back again, what makes us godly? What makes me godly? Are you godly? Is our response on how we how we uh, respond to the uh, oppression that we face? And we will face persecution if we live godly in Christ Jesus. We will face persecution. But we need to know where to go. We need to know, have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's where we find our strength. That's where we find
find our courage, that's where we get our help. Jude 1, 20 and 21, it says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. <clears throat> it's not give up in despair like we talked about Judas. But when we find that we have come short, let's be like Peter. He went out and wept bitterly, and he came seeking the Lord, who was one of the first people at the tomb when they said, the tomb is empty. Peter was there. He did not forsake. To give us a picture of how we should respond and how we should relate, <clears throat> Acts 2, 46 and 47, it says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. I like that. Singleness of heart, not double heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Again, this is a copied out of Adam Clark's commentary. A true picture of genuine Christian fellowship. They ate their bread. There's no great fanfare, neither fasting nor feasting, they ate their bread. The Holy Spirit had done in their souls his reflection. By his refining influence, always moderation, always contentment, they were full of gladness, spiritual joy and happiness, and singleness of heart. Every man worthy of the confidence of his neighbor and all walking by the same rule and minding the same thing. A picture of fellowship, one with another. We don't, we don't always have to be out to guard, to watch what you know, make sure that everybody says everything just right. And if, if one word doesn't come out quite right, then we latch onto that. We, well, this, he, his heart's wrong. No, it, it's having confidence in our neighbor, as it says here, or our brother or sister, walking by the same rule and minding the same thing. Forbearing one another in love is another verse that we could bring out. And then, then the churches... Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. The churches had rest. There's a picture again of godliness. That when we can relate to a scene like this, these are, were God's people and they were living in the constant awareness of the presence of God. In closing, 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 20 to 22, it says, But in a great house there were not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man purge, therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also useful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. A great house has many different vessels in it. Here it says it has gold and silver and wood and earth. Some to honor and some to dishonor. That's not saying that, it, that we're not likening this to the church where some are vessels of gold, some are vessels of wood. But rather that within ourselves there are things that, that will sustain, that will be eternal. There are things that will not last. Or we can say that it's there are things, the, the gold and the silver are the things that, that pertain to God and what God wants for us. And the wood and the earth could be also as things that, that are to dishonor. There are things that, that we need to evaluate and eradicate out of our life. And many of those things, many times, at least I find it, is, is words and attitudes and thoughts. Things that many many times are never, are not seen. But if a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So what makes you godly? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not what we say that makes us godly, but it's what we are. Shall we do it and pray? <clears throat>
look at is maybe a pretty picture. Don't need to see it. How you see it. And as you continue to work in our hearts, you continue to sanctify and weed out the things that are hindering us in the spiritual growth with you. Open it up for testimony or correction or whatever the Lord may want.